Greetings, emergency medicine interns. I'm Sandy Werner. I'm from Metro Health Medical Center, and this is a fast lecture. Well, actually, it's the fast lecture, but it will be pretty fast, like 20 minutes or less. So let's get started. So we are going to talk about the indications of the fast exam, why we're doing it. I will only touch briefly on the extended fast because you guys have already had a great cardiac lecture and an awesome lung lecture. So those components have kind of been covered. We'll go through the fast windows, the normal sonographic anatomy, what a positive fast looks like, how to interpret it, and I'll also give you some key take-home points. So the fast exam, well, basically anybody with a bad trauma, whether it's blunt, penetrating, it, whether they're an adult, a pediatric, or a pregnant patient, they should all have a fast exam. The primary goal of this exam is to identify blood in the peritoneal cavity and blood in the pericardial space. It's not intended to identify all intra-abdominal pathology or especially rare retroperitoneal trauma. And the extended exam includes hemothorax, pneumothorax, hemodynamic status, solid organ injury, pelvic hemorrhage, and some folks are even looking at long bone fractures in their extended fast exam. So the fast exam is critical to identifying those patients who need to go to the OR right now. So in the primary survey, in a hemodynamically unstable patient, you can rapidly figure out if they have a belly full of blood or a chest full of blood and need to go to the OR. In penetrating trauma, it's really helpful for your surgeons to know where the blood is. Is it in the thorax? Is it in the pericardium? Or is it in the abdomen? Or is it everywhere? Because that's going to help them decide which part to open first. And then in those stable patients, especially if they're becoming unstable, you may want to repeat the fast exam because if it was maybe positive 20 minutes ago, it might be grossly positive now. Some of the limitations to the fast exam, people with a very large body habitus can be difficult to scan for any, any uh, um, application. If there's a lot of subcutaneous air, especially if somebody has a pneumothorax and they have that subcutaneous air, that crepitus all the way down their abdomen and along their flanks, good luck getting those fast images because as you know, air is the enemy of ultrasound. An empty bladder can make things difficult because it's hard to see a free fluid amongst the loops of bowel, unless there's quite a bit of it. And just remember that the fast is time dependent. If you do the fast exam right after the injury, as sometimes happens with our, our life flight crew and they don't see any free fluid. And when they arrive to us 20 to 30 minutes later and we say the fast is positive, like, wait a minute, how did I miss that? And they probably didn't. There probably just wasn't 200 to 300 cc's of blood so they could actually see that the fast was positive. Which transducer? Well, you guys already know the answer to this question. Something that's a low frequency. You can use a curvilinear, you can use a phased array. There are also some manufacturers that make a small footprint curvilinear. So it's still a curvilinear, but it's got a much smaller footprint. The advantage of that type of transducer and the phased array is that they get in between the rib spaces really nicely. So what views are we looking at? Well, we're looking at the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the heart, and typically you try the subxiphoid first and then move on to the parasternal long axis if you can't get that. And then also the pelvic or suprapubic view. We often get questions about, well, which one do I scan first? And you know, there's a couple of ways of looking at this. Many people start with that cardiac view because that's likely the most lethal pathology. If you are, have a pericardial effusion, it doesn't take a lot to develop tamponade. The pericardium does stretch, but it stretches very slowly. So not much fluid and you can start to have tamponade. So some people start there and then typically work around in a diamond shape. So they'll start cardiac, go to right upper quadrant down and around. Some folks say, well, I'm going to start with the right upper quadrant because that's most likely going to give me that, that um, it's a really positive fast. I'll be able to tell that right away and I may not have to do any more. And then they make their diamond this way. And other folks will say, well, I'm going to take the pathology into consideration. So if they've been stabbed in the chest, I'm probably going for that cardiac view first. On the other hand, if they've been run over and they have big tire tracks over their abdomen and legs and the chest looks okay, I might start with the right upper quadrant. 
So um, that's typically how you'll decide which place to scan first. And many people just make a diamond of gel so that they can just move, slide the probe along the liver edge from the cardiac view and down along the pericolic gutter to the bladder and up the pericolic gutter. So you can see if there's fluid accumulating in those pericolic gutters. For this lecture though, I am actually going to scan and I'm going to start with the, both of the upper quadrant views, just because the anatomy is comparable. So we'll start with the right upper quadrant, aka perihepatic, aka Morrison's pouch. And yes, there is Dr. Morrison himself, James Rutherford Morrison, born in 1853. He has a pouch named after him, a surgical incision, and then he invented some kind of cool antiseptic dressing uh, in World War I. So he had a pretty long career. Um, I like to think of it as the peri perihepatic space because you know our aim is really to look in the perihepatic area. I want to see above the liver, I want to see the liver, and I want to see below the liver. So I think that's a good way to think of it. I want to see what's up going on in the chest. I want to see the diaphragm. I want to look at the subdiaphragmatic space, and then I want to look in Morrison's pouch and all the way to the tip of the liver. So our ultrasound view, and you'll notice with the transducer position that the scanner is actually anchoring their hand on the body. And anchoring your hand is actually a really good way to help you improve your scanning, because then you can, you can make those fine hand movements. This will be super important to doing procedural ultrasound. The indicator is towards the head and rotated slightly posteriorly. And that's usually the best position to get the, um, to get the image that you need, usually right along the mid axillary line. And then on the right, you can see the image from the top down, you see the subcutaneous tissue, the liver, and then you see Morrison's pouch, which is that potential space between the liver and the kidney. Posterior to the kidney, you can actually see the spine with a lot of shadowing behind it. And then you'll see the diaphragm to the left of that, or it's basically towards the patient's head. And standing through the whole window, You'll see at the left is the diaphragm and the liver, and then this vessel posterior and medial to the liver is actually your IVC. And then as we scan down, you can see we're scanning through the liver, we get to the kidney, to Morrison's pouch, and then we're going to end at the liver tip so that you can actually see the pericolic gutter with the bowel in it with those nice, weird, uh, dirty shadowing from air. So we're going to move on to the perisplenic view. And again, the concept is the same. We're going to look, look at the thoracic cavity above the spleen, uh, above the diaphragm. We're looking at the diaphragm and just below it, we're looking at the spleen. And then we want to see that potential space between the spleen and the kidney and all the way to the tip of the spleen. Now keep in mind that the spleen is usually posterior and it's usually smaller, significantly smaller than the liver. So often you'll need the probe to be so far uh, towards the patient's back that you're actually resting your hand on the bed. If you're too far anterior, you're actually going to be looking into the stomach and you'll probably get a chance to do that while you're scanning. And again, the indicator is towards the head. So the ultrasound image from, from the near field back, you'll see the, the uh, subcutaneous tissue, then the spleen, that's potential space between the spleen and the kidney where there's that bright white band of fascia the spine, which apparently is a uh posterior to the kidney, and then again, the diaphragm to the left with the thoracic cavity above it. So there's your entire window. Um, and again, you wanna scan all the way to the tip of the liver inferiorly where you can see the left side uh, pericolic gutter. And then we're moving on to the suprapubic or pelvic view. Hey, wait, where's the bladder? Oh, oh yeah, this is just a reminder that the bladder really is in the pelvis. In fact, it's just above the pubic symphysis. And sometimes people will scan the abdomen and they'll say, oh, the bladder's empty or I can't find it. And often it's because they're just too superior. So one trick you can use is actually to, to find the pubic symphysis with your ultrasound and it's a bone. So everything is gonna be nice, heavy shadowing behind it. You can kind of see the cartilage in the middle of it and then you'll move your transducer upwards and that will give you a nice view of the bladder. And in this case, you can see that the uterus is going to be posteriorly and superior to the bladder. So the pelvic window is often easier to find in the transverse view. 
And then you'll want to rotate your transducer so that you're in the, the sagittal view. And that will be the bladder view where you're actually most likely to see the positive findings. It's easier to see the positive findings in the sagittal view. I also wanna point out that this is um, the male anatomy. So you have the seminal vesicles, you can see them posterior to the bladder, and then you can see them inferior and posterior on your sagittal view. Um, so here's just the difference between the male versus the female anatomy. You can see with the female, the uterus is posterior. If it's an antiverted or antiflexed uterus, it will um, come up behind and sometimes superior to the bladder. And you can see that there's bowel behind that. And often you'll just see the bladder and you'll see a lot of bowel gas right up against it. And that's a normal finding. So the last view we'll talk about is the cardiac. And this is the subxiphoid view. And you'll notice that you'll need quite a bit of depth right, to actually be able to see the entire heart. So we're using the liver as a window. And sometimes you're a little bit to the right and angling to the um, patient's right to see the pericardial view, but sometimes you can get it directly at the sub xiphoid space. So we're showing the, the scanner's hand position here and notice the indicator is to the right and the scanner is holding their hand kind of like they're a three-year-old using a spoon. Um, so that that grip is going to be better than your overhand grip in allowing you to lay your hand down pretty flat, which you'll probably need to do to sneak up under that xiphoid process and get this view. So on the ultrasound image, what you'll see first is a little bit of subcutaneous tissue, then the liver, and then the first chamber that you'll see is the right ventricle and then the left ventricle. And you can see the bright white pericardium around the heart. Um, and the other view that you may need to use is the parasternal long axis. And for this, you probably want to have that phased array transducer because you'll really need to get between the ribs. And in this view, we're basically bivalving the heart, kind of like it's an oyster, we're gonna open it up. Um, and you'll be able to see very superficially the right ventricular outflow tract, the entire left ventricle behind that with the aorta, um, you'll be able to see the valve and then the outflow tract and then the mitral valve below that. And very importantly, you can see here the descending aorta posterior to the pericardium. It's a little hard to see the pericardium right near the skin above the right ventricular outflow tract, but if there's fluid around that, trust me, you'll see a separation. You can really see the pericardium well uh, towards the far field between the left atrium and the descending aorta. So you're gonna be watching for fluid there. And you guys already know the hand position for the parasternal long axis from your cardiac stuff. So what does a positive fast look like? Well, sometimes it's really obvious. So no doubt there's a lot of free fluid in this right upper quadrant fuse. These, well, not quite so much. In fact, it's you kind of have to squint at the one on the right to see that there's actually a small stripe of free fluid. So something to take note of is the shape of the fluid. So the image on the left, you can see that the fluid is really filling up Morrison's pouch and that it's actually, you can actually see the bowel in the pericolic gutter. In this image on the right, you can see the walls of the gallbladder. And you'll also notice that it's really not quite between the kidney and the liver. So make sure that the fluid you're seeing is actually filling up the whole peritoneal space and doesn't have walls around it like a cyst, the gallbladder. Um, I once saw someone with a very large pancreatic pseudocyst and it was thought to be a positive fast because they really didn't, didn't or, or weren't able to appreciate the shape of the cyst um, as opposed to the, it being free fluid. So take home point, fluid takes the shape of the container surrounding it. So make note of that as you're doing your FAST exam. The other thing to take into account is what's going on clinically with the patient. If you have a patient with this small amount of free fluid and they are grossly unstable, something else is going on. Do they have pericardial tamponade? Are they bleeding out in your emergency department? I don't know, but this FAST is not causing them to have no blood pressure. On the other hand, if you have a trauma, a known cirrhotic, known alcoholic who came in as a trauma because he fell off the bar stool backwards and bumped his head. And your ultrasound folks are in there and they wanna do the fast exam because they should do it. 
and they do it. And there's a whole lot of free fluid in there. I hope you're thinking, oh, wait a minute. This guy's blood pressure is 150 over 90. His heart rate's 70. He's joking around. Uh, um, he's an alcoholic. Oh gosh, I bet that's ascites. And you would be correct. So interpret the fast in the clinical context. And the other thing is that free fluid is not always blood. It could be ascites. It could be perineal dialysate fluid. It could be urine if the bladder is ruptured. So just think about that. So the positive left upper quadrant, and here you'll notice that the free fluid is actually above the spleen. So in the subdiaphragmatic space, this is not at all uncommon, but this will be the first place that you'll see free fluid subdiaphragmatically. And here, where's the fluid? Well, you guys have already figured this out because there's a diaphragm, the bright white stripe of that thin muscle, and above it is the fluid. So that's a nice hemothorax. There's another example of a hemothorax, and you can actually see the lung, aerated lung flapping around in that hemothorax. And you also notice, hmm, that fluid is not anechoic. You know, some of it has layered out, and you have to keep in mind that blood clots. So particularly if you are getting a trauma patient who's being transferred to you and it's been a few hours since their trauma, don't be surprised if the blood has become echogenic or at least some of it as it is starting to clot. So remember, blood clots. The pelvic view, and here again, we're looking at the sagittal view. You can see the fluid surrounding the uterus and edging up against the bladder. Male view, where you can see the fluid. I think there's maybe a little bit of a clot there um, or that may be a loop of bowel. And then don't confuse that with the seminal vesicles. Here's another example of a really positive pelvic view. And this is, um, you can see the bowel floating there in the, the, uh, the blood. And this actually, this patient had most of their blood in the pelvis and they had a ruptured spleen. It was a 10 year old who came off his skateboard, but he'd been walking around for a couple hours until he finally started to feel a little bit dizzy and kind of sick. So his parents brought him in and, and he actually had a grade four spleen rupture um, and amazingly did well with just observation and no, no operative intervention and went home in like five days. But you can also see that this is a couple hours old and the blood has started to clot. Um, so that's a very common thing uh, if you're seeing a trauma patient a couple hours out. Uh, the sub xiphoid view, well, pretty obviously there's a problem here. There's like not a right ventricle. Um, so this is a positive sub xiphoid cardiac view with the normal one in the lower right. And here's another example. And you'll note that the right ventricle is bowing in a bit. And that should send you thinking, ooh, there's something really bad going on. So it doesn't take a lot of fluid to cause pericardial tamponade. And this person might be amenable to a pericardiocentesis. Um, they probably need to have their chest cracked. It's just going to be, where is it going to be done? In your ED or in the OR? And here's another example. This person is in a really bad way. So this is the liver. You're like, wow, that liver's really big. Except wait, the heart is here. So what's going on? Oh, wait, all of this is clotted blood around the heart. So pericardiocentesis won't be any use here. Um, and the patient's heart is really struggling. And even if you crack the chest, uh, they may not have a great outcome. And then the parasternal view, as I mentioned before, the blood is going to cross over the top of the aorta. And now you can really see that there's fluid all the way around the heart. So where it was difficult to see the pericardium close to the surface of the skin, you can actually see really well that now that the area is filled with fluid. And then the normal parasternal long axis is shown to the lower right. And this is an example of a very large effusion. You can see that there's some bowing there of the right ventricle, um, but this effusion may actually be something medical going on because it's so large and the pericardial sac doesn't stretch quickly, but you could accumulate this much blood in a month or so, or this much fluid if this was say a malignant, um, a malignant uh, effusion. All right, so our FAST exam, the primary goal is to find the blood. There's an extended exam where you're gonna look at a lot more pieces parts. And remember, you're not going to find all of the pathology. Our limitations, large body habitus, sub-Q air, empty bladder, and it is a time-dependent study. Our take-home points, free fluid does not necessarily equal blood. 
Fluid takes the shape of the container surrounding it, blood clots. Free fluid in the left upper quadrant view is often subdiaphragmatic. And then you need to interpret the fast in the clinical context. And in just exactly 20 minutes, we're done. So thank you. I can't take any questions because we're not live. So keep calm and scan on.